Hi there, this is David Dyer again, and this is going to be part two of a message on the image of the invisible God. Now I would like to ask you, please, please do not watch this video until you have seen the first one in its entirety. If you have not watched the first video on this subject, then there is no way you can really understand what we're about to say in this second video. So please take some time. It's not that long a video. The first one isn't that long. And watch the first video because it is the basis that is necessary for you to have in order to really appreciate and understand this second video. In the first video, we talked about how the scriptures revealed Jesus as being the image of the invisible God, not being God Jr. or another bloke, but God expressing himself, revealing himself to us. Jesus is God incarnate. He is the God of the universe imaging or expressing himself to us. Now on this basis, we have some really good news. Really good news. Without seeing who Jesus is, if we're confused about the Son of God, then there's no way that we can understand the fullness of the gospel. There are parts of the good news message that are going to be lost to us. They'll just go right over our heads will be confusing to us. We won't really get them. But once we see who Jesus is, then other parts of the New Testament just stand out with such clarity and become so much more precious and so much more interesting and glorious to us. So we're going to read a few more verses here, which are part of this wonderful revelation. We read in... Romans 8, 29. Whom he foreknew, he also predetermined or predestinated that they would be conformed to the image of his Son. Wow, that's really neat. God has preordained or predestinated us to be conformed to something, to be changed be made different and made like something else. It says here that we're to be conformed to the image of his son. Let's go on. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. What is the image of the earthly? Well, you're looking at it. Adam. Man, a human being, every time you look in the mirror, you see the image of the earthly. But what is the image of the heavenly? We've borne the image of the earthly. Here we are bearing it, and sometimes it's not so easy to bear. But the Bible says that we are to bear the image of the heavenly. Now another verse here. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with our faces unveiled through seeing and then reflecting the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. This work is done by the Lord, the Spirit. Wow. Did you see that? That same image. What image is that? The image of the invisible God. Jesus is that image. That's who he is. He is the image of the invisible God. And according to the scriptures, once again, it's not me saying this, but it's the scriptures teaching us this, we can be transformed from one degree of glory to another degree of glory, into that same image. Now, is that possible? How could that possibly be? We, who look like Adam and Eve, <laughs> in case you're a female, 
We're bearing the image of Adam, of the earth. But God is calling us to something higher, to something better. He is calling us to bear the image of the heavenly. That same image, the image of the invisible God. Do you see how this elevates the gospel message? The gospel message is not just about our being forgiven and going to heaven. It's not just about escaping the punishment for our sins. There's something much, much more elevated and sublime and glorious than merely escaping our just punishment. We are being called to be transformed. We are being called to be changed. We are being called to participate in something unbelievable. Yet we have to believe it. Something so fantastic that even science fiction couldn't think it up. We're being called to be changed into the image of God himself. From glory to to glory, from one degree of glory to another degree of glory, more and more, until we arrive somewhere at the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But who is Christ? He is God revealed, God expressed, God imaged. And we are called to arrive at that stature at that fullness, at that image, that same exact image. God has opened the way. He's opened the door for something fantastic. And that is for we, mere human beings, to become something eternal and glorious. He's done that by dying on the cross for our sins and making his own life available to us. As we've spoken about in other videos, the eternal life of God was revealed in Jesus Christ so that we could have it. We could be born from above. We could become the sons and daughters of God. We could become his children who have the same life as he does. We can be born of the incorruptible seed of God through the Holy Spirit. And by becoming his sons and daughters, we have the possibility of then being changed into that same image. Wow. Think about that. Meditate on that. Review these scriptures. Open up to God. Let him show you what this means. This is fantastic, brothers and sisters. We can have, we can become what he is. He's offered all of himself to us. He poured out his Holy Spirit. He's not dribbling out the Holy Spirit. He's not pouring it out by the tablespoonful. He has poured it out. He turned the bucket over. He poured it out freely and completely. I have never read a Bible verse that places any limit upon how much of God we can have. There are no restrictions. He has offered himself to us. All that he is, his own life, his own nature, his own glory, his own power, his own authority has been offered to man freely, without cost. And this is the good news. This is wonderful message. This is an unbelievable thing that we mere human beings can be changed into the image of the invisible God. That same image that Jesus is and was from one degree of glory to another. Brothers and sisters, let us 
run after this. Let us pursue it. Let us lay hold of it. Don't waste your life. Don't waste this opportunity. Don't waste the time you have left because it may be short. Run after God and lay hold of the promises. Take advantage of his offer. Be obtaining all that you can get. The table of Jesus' wedding feast is already laid out. It's so loaded down, I think it's sort of bending under the weight if something eternal could bend. And the Spirit and the Bride are calling for us to come. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Come. Feel yourself. Eat to the full. Over and over again, daily, feel yourself with God because this offer is only for a limited time. During this brief stay here on the earth, God himself has made available to us all that he is without any restrictions that I've ever been able to find. Now, over my years as a Christian, I've run into different people, different groups, thinking that they are going to restore unity to the body of Christ. They all have their formula. Some have a formula about getting the name of the church right. It has to be the name of the city. Other people think that you need to speak when the Bible speaks and remain silent when the Bible remains silent. Other people think you need to agree with them. I like that better because if everyone would agree with me, then there'd be unity with everyone. Especially agreeing with me, it would work just great. But <laughs> that's not going to happen, is it? And a lot of them base these um, projects of theirs, these unity projects, on John chapter 17. John chapter 17 contains a prayer of Jesus, which he prayed immediately before he was crucified. This was at the very peak of his ministry, a very critical point in his life. So obviously this prayer is important. And Jesus prays in that prayer that would we, we would all be one. And so many people take that to mean that Jesus was praying that all Christians would get along with each other, that they would have unity, that they would be in agreement about everything. Well, obviously, unity and agreeing, being of one heart and one mind, is a scriptural idea. But if Jesus was praying to the Father, groaning and calling out to the Father for unity among Christians and oneness among Christian groups, then 2,000 years have passed, almost, and God the Father has not heard or answered Jesus' prayer. Every day that goes by, there's another group that starts up on a street corner with a new doctrine, a new emphasis, a new name, and this unity that many people are preaching. They have their leaders and their apostles and all these people running around trying to restore the church and restore unity, I've noticed a certain um, lack of success in this project. So let's take another look at what Jesus was asking the Father for. What did he mean when he prayed about oneness? Let's read from John 17 here, and then we'll talk about it. In John 17, 11, we read, Holy Father, keep those whom you have given me in your name so that they may be one in the same way that we are one. In verses 20 through 22, I am not only praying for them, but also for all those who will believe in me through their word so that there might be a complete oneness. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be one with us in our oneness, 
so that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me. I have given to them so that there would be a complete oneness to the degree that we are one. I in them and you in me. This is so that they would be perfected into our oneness in order that the world would know that you sent me and loved them just as you loved me. Wow. So this translation shows us that horizontal unity between believers is not what Jesus was asking for. He was pleading with the Father for another kind of unity, a vertical unity, a unity between us and Him. Father, as you are in me, and I am in you, may they be one with us in our oneness, one in us, together with us. This is the unity that Jesus is desiring. This is the unity that the Father planned. Not that we would just be able to get along with those difficult Christians who don't agree with us. Something more sublime, something more heavenly, something more incredible is here for us to see. And not only see, but to be a part of. Think about this verse, that same image. This is what he was praying for that we would be changed, that we would become one with Him. Christians getting along with each other isn't going to convince the world of much of anything. But if you and I become more and more one with God Himself, there is going to be a real change in our lives and people are going to notice. They're going to see something heavenly, something otherworldly, something they've never seen before, a human being filled with God. And that is going to convince them that Jesus is real, that the Father sent him, that he's doing a work, a real, unbelievable work in human beings, that he's changing them to be like himself. This will convince the world that Jesus came, that the Father sent him, that he is doing something wonderful. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is so important. This is so essential. We can't just have the poor, watered-down gospel of going to heaven someday when we die. The gospel is so much more than that. It's a rich, full experience of God himself knowing him more and more intimately and being changed to be like him so that when he appears, we will be like him. So that when he appears, I'm going to say this again, we will be like him. This is something that needs to be happening now. Something that happens because we seek his face. We open up our hearts we give him our lives. We yield ourselves completely to him and let him do his work in us at whatever cost. We have the wonderful opportunity of being joined in the eternal union of the Father and the Son, becoming part of that unity, being included in that image, being part of his divinity. Don't waste time. Don't miss this opportunity. Go for it. Now, today. Today, right now. Start a new chapter in your life. Whatever you are doing that's holding you back, whatever sin is hindering you, come to him and repent and give him permission to do whatever he has to do, anything, to free you from that sin and bring you on into him, into his fullness, into his riches, into the full stature 
This is what God is calling you to. Do not miss it. Do it today. Let's get on with it. When, when Adam was in the garden, God made a bride for him. When Adam looked at her, he said, This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It's interesting that someday Jesus is going to get married. But just as Adam could not marry one of the animals, a sheep, a goat, a bird, a pig, God cannot marry a being that is dissimilar, unlike himself. It just, he can't do it. Even God's law prohibits intimate relationships between dissimilar species. So in order for Jesus to get married, he is going to have to find a bride that is bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, spirit of his spirit, life of his life, and nature of his nature. He cannot marry a mere human being. Now Jesus did become a human being, and so he took humanity upon himself. But in our turn, we must take on divinity. We must become like him. We, by receiving the life of the Father, become born of God and become part of another race. We become brothers and sisters of Jesus. We become part of God's family. And this qualifies us to be part of the future eternal wedding. But there's another qualification that we have to think about. Marriage demands a certain maturity on the part of those getting married, especially the woman. And the Bible teaches us, Paul teaches that the woman, if she has passed the flower of her age, that is, if she has passed puberty, can get married. She doesn't sin. So as a believer, we need to grow up to maturity. We need to pass the flower of our age. We need to be changed inwardly and enter into this oneness with God. So that when Jesus looks at us, on that wonderful day, he can say, yes, she is like me, bone of my bone, nature of my nature, life of my life, and there can be a wedding. The Bible says, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, for the bride has made herself ready. We must become ready. And this ready is something that's done by the Lord himself, by the Holy Spirit, but only with our complete cooperation and yielding to him so he can do it. So this is the gospel message, brothers and sisters, that we can be changed into that same image. Jesus is the image of the invisible God not some other thing. He is the image, the exact image of his essence. And we can be changed into that same image by the Spirit of the Lord. Little by little, from glory to glory, day by day, as we yield ourselves to him, obey him, and cooperate with him in his work. Now, this is a real good news message. This is a message that's worth preaching and declaring openly and boldly to everyone and anyone. In the last video, I said that we'll never see God because he is invisible. God the Father is invisible. But now I'm going to change that just a little bit. 
We are going to actually see God one day. Let me read you a really glorious verse. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It is that very same God who said, Light, shine out of the darkness, who has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, or Jesus, the Anointed One. We are going to see his face someday. We're going to see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, where God has been, is, and always will be revealed in the face of his Son, his perfect and exact image. May we be getting ready and looking forward to that day until he comes. Amen.